good. Welcome back to the channel. So today's a little bit different of a video than normal. Normally I do how-to videos or show you a day in the life and things like that. But today I went on Instagram and I put up a question box and I want to do a Q&A. So it's just going to be me um, answering some questions that I get quite often from people. And I give them the opportunity to send them to me and have me answer here in one um, complete video so you can just come through and watch all of the questions. So I'm just going to jump right on to it and answer these questions. So the first question that I got was about myself. So somebody that was new to the channel and um, or new to my Instagram page and that they just wanted to know more about me. So I'm going to go ahead and share my story. I know some of you that have been here since the very beginning have heard this story many times. Um, if you follow me on multiple platforms, then you probably heard this story lots of times. But for anyone that's new here, um, here's just a little quick uh, story, backstory kind of about me and what our family does. So we are a backgrounding family. So we background cattle. My husband is a fourth generation cattle rancher and um, I am a city girl that married into the cattle ranching farming lifestyle. So about five years ago, um, my middle daughter had extreme eczema and it didn't start until we had given her some gluten into her diet. And that, of course, resulted into the eczema. But at the time, I hadn't correlated the two of them. And um, I have celiac disease, so I was gluten-free. And we chose to keep our children gluten-free as they were babies. And when they got older, that we, were, um, we would slowly introduce the gluten into their body. So when my middle daughter was three or four years old, we introduced gluten slowly into her diet. She had no reaction that we could see of. Any of the common reactions like stomach problems, diarrhea, constipation, crying all the time, those kinds of things. She didn't have any of them. And so we continued to give her more and more gluten until we were giving her full gluten and she was eating um, whatever my husband was eating. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. And when I say gluten-free, it was all store-bought gluten-free. So all of the processed snacks that were gluten-free um, or, rate, or processed snacks that were regular. So she was eating anything from the store. I At the time, I did make um, meals at home, but I wasn't making completely from scratch meals, if that makes sense. Um, and so it was about three or four months in when she got a little small patch of eczema, and I didn't think much of it. I started putting the Aveeno Baby eczema cream on it, and then I switched, um, it jumped to the other arm, and so I kept doing it until it started to grow everywhere. All of the crevices of her body, all the little creases behind the legs, um, in the genital area, on her arms, and it wouldn't go away. And so then I started taking her to the doctor, and of course they told me it was eczema, which I already knew it was, and to give, and would give me a steroid cream. Long story short, I tried every topical cream. I, I was attacking this topically until um, I realized that that wasn't going to work. And I did try the steroid cream once, but it did take it away. But as soon as I stopped using it, it came back and it came back even angrier than it was when we first started. So as it kept growing and getting worse and nothing was working, every cream that I tried did not take it away. Um, it was in about the third night in a row of her waking me up in the middle of the night crying and bleeding because she was scratching in her sleep and they were just so itchy that I knew I was missing something. And I stayed awake and I scoured the internet for anything I could find that had to do with eczema. And that's when I stumbled upon a blog from my mom. And I can't even remember the blog name, um, but I was in a moment of desperation. And I found her sharing her story about how she healed her daughter with food. And that's kind of where I started in my homesteading journey. It was in that moment that I realized that that was the missing link, that the eczema cannot be healed topically. It all starts within. And so I um, changed everything in our diet. I started cooking from scratch. I started growing a small garden. And I just evolved from there where I can grow, raise, um, make anything that I can right here on my own homestead if I can. So that's kind of the backstory about us, a city girl gone country. <laughs> And, um, and why I started on this journey and um, my beliefs in how food is just so powerful. It is our medicine if we allow it to be. Um, so that's my story about me. Um, I do share a little bit more about that in my about me on the blog, which I'll link at the, uh, at the bottom of this description. Um, in that about two and a half years ago, my husband and I 
made the biggest decision of our life and we decided to grow our operation and move cross country from California to Missouri. And that leads me into my next question and that was what, um, explain your cross country move to Missouri. So we are both born and raised in California, my husband and I. We both um, grew up in the same area and our family is all there, all of our friends are there. It was one of the hardest decisions we had to make. Um, we miss them dearly, but we know 100% that this is where God has sent us. And um, it just was a, it took us about five years of trying multiple different places. We knew we wanted to grow our operation, our background being operate, cattle operation, but um, in California, it just wasn't, it wasn't going to work just with um, costs and things like that. We, it wasn't a money-making deal. And so in order to expand, we had to go into a different state. And so we did a lot of research. We searched a lot of places. We made multiple trips um, out to the Midwest and landed here in Missouri. And we absolutely love it. Within a month, we met some people and made friends that I can't believe we, they haven't been a part of our life forever and so it's been a very very good move um it's been very very good for the expansion of our operation and the land and all of that so um that happened about two and a half years ago so we've been here for about two and a half years and it was definitely one of the best decisions that we made okay the third question i got was how was my birthday so my birthday was uh last monday and I got the question on how it was. It was very nice. Um, we went to a goat tying jackpot, my girls rodeo. And so they had a goat tying jackpot that night. And so we went to dinner and then we took the girls there. So nothing special. However, we are heading to Maui. And so actually when I'm filming this, we are leaving in a couple days, but when you guys are watching this, it'll be, we'll already be there. Um, but, uh, that'll be my birthday present. That'll be when I really celebrate. Okay. Question number four. So with mulch, so I shared on Instagram a couple days ago on the best way to attack weeds in your garden, and that is to heavy mulch them. And I gave some suggestions on mulch, which would be wood chips, straw, um, old hay, make sure that's old, not fresh hay. And, uh, what else did I say? Sawdust. There's, there's different things that you can wood chips. Maybe I already said that, um, bark, that kind of stuff you can the best way to get rid of weeds or to keep them at bay in your garden is to heavy heavy mulch and i'm talking like six inches heavy mulch your weeds so they're getting zero sunlight they're completely dark and somebody asked um with that how do you know if it has seed in it when you're using hay versus straw so i prefer to use straw over hay and the straw is the seed is already out and you're just left with the tube and so um that will help you to not be replanting your garden with hay seed. <laughs> um, and so I usually use straw, but if you're going to use hay, um, there's two ways you can do this. One is I don't use anything less than a year old hay. So it's old, it's rotted, it, the seeds are no longer able to germinate because they've rotted. Or you can actually, if you have chickens, put your chickens in that hay and let them eat all the seed out. Let them have at it for a month or so, and then you can take that hay and put it Another good option, which is kind of in the lines of hay and um, straw, would be grass clippings. That is a, if you have a lot of lawn and you come up with a lot of grass clippings, that, that is a fantastic mulch to keep your weeds down. Um, it's really heavy and it dries almost, I mean, within a day or two, it's completely dry. It's no longer green. And that's a really, really good free mulch. So save your grass clippings if, um, if that's something that you want to do. Okay, question, I think we're on five. Does the wind play a factor with mulch? So going back along the lines of mulch, and that is, does the wind play a factor? I mean, I guess it depends on what kind of mulch you're using. So with straw, obviously it's really light, um, but I've never really had a problem with the wind blowing it all over. You're gonna lose some, obviously. The wind is gonna pick up some, especially if you have high winds. I will say that I have to re-mulch everything every single year so it usually lasts for a season i usually don't have to do more within the season sometimes i do if we get a really really here in missouri sometimes we can get really high winds so if we do i will definitely um molt more again throughout the season but typically i don't need to i just need to do it every single year with new plants in the ground so the next question i got is what is my routine for making bread each week so if you have followed me for a while you know that I make all of our own bread 
and that's kind of therapeutic for me. It's one thing that is like a non-negotiable in my house. I typically never buy bread from the store. I haven't bought bread in years. However, there are certain times where I just will buy my husband. I never buy gluten-free bread from the store because we don't even like it anymore. Um, but I make all of our own bread products here in the house. And um, my routine for that typically is I do both gluten-free and regular bread on Tuesdays and Fridays. Those seem to be the days that I bake bread the most. Um, but I will do in between if I need to. And so I, t because I do it so often, it's all off of memory. I don't have to pull up any kind of recipe and I get up in the morning and it's a part of my morning routine on Tuesdays and Fridays. So I will get up, I'll do my quiet time. I will do my blog work. That's usually when I do my blog work and then I'll get dressed and go straight into the kitchen. And before I start breakfast, I make bread and put it in the oven to rise. And it usually only takes me about 10 to 15 minutes to get it made and then put into the oven to rise. Um, and then, you know, if it's a school time, if it's during the school year, then I will let it rise after breakfast. I bake it halfway through. Yeah, like, well, as soon as I get the time to go off, I just pull the bread out. It's very, very simple. So I do that on Tuesdays and Fridays. Now, if I were to make sourdough bread, that is a lot more of a process. And I still will do it on typically Tuesdays and Fridays, but I, here's the schedule I follow in terms of feeding my starter all the way to baking the bread. So I will feed my starter right before I go to bed the night before I know I want to make it. And um, typically on these, so if it's a Tuesday, I will feed my starter Monday night right before I go to bed. I will make the bread the next morning right when I wake up, I will let it rise throughout the day or if I'm making regular, I'll do all the steps throughout the day, which I have both videos out on that. So I will go ahead and link both sourdough bread videos here in the description. And then I bake the next morning. For gluten-free, typically if I follow that, I, I can be baking Tuesday night or Tuesday evening. Um, I can be baking the bread. For the regular sourdough, it's always best to let it rise overnight in the refrigerator so I won't bake till Wednesday morning. But um, that's typically the schedule, and if I stay within that, it's not too daunting, and I find that it just works and flows perfectly fine um, for how it goes into my schedule. Okay, um, a question I got was after watching my regular sourdough bread video that they were that I um, pulled flour out of the bucket and what kind of flour that was and why I don't use freshly milled in that sourdough. So I have mastered the freshly milled gluten-free bread, but I have not on regular. It's a lot different to work with. Um, there's a lot less kneading and things like that, and a lot more rest time, and I just haven't mastered it. Being that I only make bread for my husband, he's the only one that eats regular bread, I don't make it enough to really have the practice time in it, and he actually prefers a white bread. He prefers the all-purpose flour. And so since he really doesn't care, um, I have stopped trying to make it and um, him not like it and then I just end up tossing it anyways and I just go back to all-purpose flour because it works like I know how to make bread with all-purpose flour he likes it he doesn't care um, and so that's what I do however I am a big um, I want to advocate I guess I should say for freshly milled if you are struggling with gluten, if you are struggling with a lot of different things, freshly milling your flowers may be the answer for you. And so if you can take the time to practice and learn the skills you need for it, um, I highly recommend it. So for me right now in the season that we're in and that my husband doesn't really care about it and doesn't care to eat it, um, I just don't do it. But if we get to a place where I need to, I definitely highly recommend freshly milling your own flour. There's so many health benefits to it. If you um, need an account on how to do freshly milled flour and different recipes in that and breads and just in all baked goods, my dear friend Andrea at dearmark23.com, she has tons of whole grain recipes on her site and um, that would be a great place to start to get some recipes and information on that but I would definitely um, recommend looking into whole grain as opposed to all-purpose flour if that's something that, if you're having health problems, that might be a ticket that you're looking for. Okay, um, and then the last question I got is also on sourdough bread, and we went through a trend of mulch and garden to bread. <laughs> um, how do you make sourdough bread not so sour? So she, um, somebody 
asked me that how I make my bread not so sour, that it was way too, her first loaf was way too sour for her family. And um, my number one thing with that would be how often are you feeding it? So the longer it sits between feedings, the sour it gets, because that's when it's fermenting. So when you feed it again, um, you are still fermenting it, but it, it gives a more sweet flavor. And as it sits, it becomes more sour. So if you're not feeding regularly, typically that is why your bread is sour. So um, that, and then the length of time that you let your bread rise. Now, I let my bread rise all day long, and I've never, my husband has, I've never had it because I can't, but my husband has never complained that it's too sour. So I would first check with how often you're feeding. I feed at least once a day. In the summertime, you may have to feed twice a day because it's so much warmer in the outside and in the house that um, it ferments quicker. And so you may have to be feeding twice, but in the winter, I definitely only feed once. But when you smell your sourdough starter, it should be slightly sweet and slightly sour. It shouldn't be really rancid sour because if it is, you're going to get a really rancid sour bread. <laughs> um, so it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's going to have a more sour taste. So um, that's what I would check first is how often you're feeding it and if you're feeding it regularly because that definitely will play a role in how sour your bread is. So those were all of the questions that I got and um, I hope that this video was helpful and answered a little bit more about me and uh, different questions that you may have. If it's something that you would like to see again in the future, um, put a thumbs up here or ask questions in the comments here and I'd be happy to do another video with Q&A. I know I reach different people on Instagram versus Facebook versus the blog versus here so it's kind of all and I try and pull from all of them. Um, this time I only put the box on Instagram, but if you would like me to do this kind of a video again um, and you have more questions, I would be happy to do this again and go ahead and drop questions in the comments here or jump over to Instagram and ask them there or Facebook and I'll try and get a compilation of questions together or even email. I respond to emails as well. So I hope this video was helpful. Make sure to like and subscribe to it. I send out one new YouTube video every single week. Um, I dropped the link to the blog in the description. Go ahead and jump on over there and become an email subscriber. I send out two emails a week over there with recipes, gluten-free recipes, or regular ranch life, farm life, homesteading life, all of the things. Um, I hope that this video did you well, and I will see you next time. Take care.